In this lesson, we will continue our discussion of proof by contradiction. Let us recall again the proof by contradiction. Suppose that we want to establish that a statement R is true. How do we prove it by contradiction? We assume that it is false. Find a contradiction. Once we have found a contradiction, it only means that the original statement must be true. In our previous video lecture, we proved implications P implies Q by contradiction. That is, we assume P in the negation of Q and then we found a contradiction and therefore Q must be true. However, for this lesson, we will be proving statements wherein we do not have any implication of a statement R and then we want to show that this statement R is true. For example, the integer 512 cannot be written as the sum of one odd integer and two even integers. This is not an implication. For our proof, suppose that we can write 512 as a sum of one odd integer and two even integers. So that is... Five hundred twelve is equal to a plus b plus c, where a is odd and b and c are both even. I will just make use of the results that we already know about odd and even integers. Since b and c are even, b plus c must be even. And now we have a is odd. And then b plus c is even. What do we know about the sum of an odd and even number? That would be an odd number. Since a is odd and b plus c is even, a plus b plus c must be odd. However, what is a plus b plus c? That is 512. So thus... 512 is odd. And this is your contradiction. Because 512 is even. So therefore, 512 cannot be written as the sum of one odd integer and two even integers. Next, let us show that there is no smallest positive real number. Take note that this is just a negated statement. We want to always work with something which is not negated. So therefore, we prove by contradiction. We assume on the contrary that there is a smallest positive real number. So we suppose that there is a smallest positive real number. And let's say we call it R. How can we arrive at a contradiction? What will be our contradiction here? Note that R over 2 is positive and it is less than R. What have we seen here? We found a positive real number which is smaller than R. And that contradicts the fact that R is the smallest positive real number. Since r over 2 is a positive real number less than r, it contradicts the assumption that r is the smallest positive real number. Therefore, there is no smallest positive real number. Next, let us show that there do not exist integers x and y such that 12x plus 18y is equal to 1. We have no other way to prove this but by contradiction because we just have one statement here and it is negated. So let us suppose that there exist such integers x and y.
what will be our contradiction here? Notice that this one has a common factor of 2. This is 2 times 6x plus 9y is equal to 1. x and y are integers, so therefore 6x plus 9y is an integer. What does that mean? 2 divides 1. Your contradiction. Since 6x plus 9y is an integer, 2 divides 1, a contradiction. Therefore, this initial assumption must be false. That concludes your proof. Next, let us show that the real number square root of 2 is irrational. So on the contrary, we will suppose that it is rational. Let us suppose that square root of 2 is rational. That is, there exist integers, let's call it k and l, such that square root of 2 is equal to k over l. For k and l here, we will assume that k over l is already in lowest terms. That is, we assume that k and l have no common factor. In other words, their greatest common factor is 1. So I will write here k and l such that gcf of k and l is 1 and square root of 2 is equal to k over l. Let us square both sides of this equation. We get that 2 is equal to k squared over l squared and we have 2L squared is equal to K squared. What does this mean? This means that K squared is even because we have 2 times an integer. Hence, K squared is even. By result 3 of lecture 8, K must be even. Thus, we can find an integer. What integer can we use? Let's say S such that k is equal to 2s for some integer s. What will we do with this? Let us plug it in this equation. Let's call this 1. If 2l squared is equal to 4s squared. Hence, we get that L squared is equal to 2S squared. What does this mean again? L squared is equal to 2 times an integer. So, therefore, L squared is even. And so, L again is even. So, we now say by result 3, again, of the previous video lecture, L is also even. Can you already see the contradiction here? What do we have? K is even and L is even. Which means that both of them are divisible by 2. It contradicts the fact that they have no common factor. Let me just continue here. So since we have found a contradiction, therefore, square root of 2 must be irrational. For our next example, we want to generalize this result. We want to show that the square root of any prime number is always irrational. In order to do that, let we will be using this theorem. Let P be a prime number. If P divides AB, then P divides A or P divides B. Take note that the important hypothesis here is that P must be a prime number. This one only works when P is prime. For example, 3 divides 24 and we can write 24 as 
6 times 4. In this case, 3 divides 6. It does not divide 4, but it only says that the prime must divide at least one of this. And here we have that 3 divides 6. That is true. Or we can also write 24 as 8 times 3. Again, it divides at least one of the factors. In this case, it divides 3. This only works for a prime number because once this is no longer a prime number, let's say 6. 6 divides 12, but this 12 here is 4 times 3. But 6 does not divide 4 and 6 does not divide 3. We will not be proving this theorem for now. We will just use this to prove our next result. The proof of this statement, if p is prime, square root of p is irrational, is very much similar to the proof of square root of 2 being irrational. Let us now prove this statement, if p is prime, square root of p is irrational. I will just be giving the sketch of the proof, meaning to say I will not be writing down all the sentences, but you should be able to fill that up. So for the sketch of the proof, Again, we start with the premise P is prime, but we will proceed by contradiction. So therefore, we assume the negation of the conclusion. Since square root of P is rational, there exist integers K and L such that the GCF again of K and L is equal to 1 and square root of p is equal to k over l. Meaning to say, k over l is already in lowest terms. Just like what we did with example number 4, we can get rid of the square root sign here. So we have p l squared is equal to k squared, which means that p divides k squared. However, if we take a look at this theorem, if a prime number divides a product of two numbers, then it must divide at least one of the two numbers. However, you have here k squared. What do we get from here? p must divide k. And so, we can write k as p times an integer, let's call it s, such that k is equal to ps. We will plug in this value to this equation. We get PL squared is equal to P squared S squared. Divide both sides by P. We can do that because P is not zero because P is prime. So we have L squared is equal to PS squared, which means that P divides L squared. Using this theorem again, we have that P divides L. What did we get here? P divides K and P divides L. That is, they have a common factor of P. K and L have a common factor of P and it contradicts this assumption that they have no common factor. So therefore, Square root of P is irrational. Sometimes it can be difficult to find the contradiction that arises from the assumption not R. It takes practice and sort of creativity to do that. One can tell that a result could be proved by contradiction because the statement has some negative sounding words. For instance, in the examples that we discussed, there is no smallest real number. The number square root of 2 is not rational. If x is even, then 2 does not divide x squared plus 1. These are hints for you that you can proceed by contradiction. It is usually easier to work with positive conditions rather than negative conditions. Which is why proofs by contradiction work so well in these cases. The negative conditions are turned positive after negating the statement. However, if a proof can be done without a contradiction, that is usually a better option because you never enter an imaginary world 
where you assume something you are hoping to show is false. Usually, when you are proving an implication, P implies Q, this is the order for which you are going to prove it. If you can prove it directly, go ahead. If it is difficult to prove it using direct proof, proceed by contrapositive. And then the last option is proof by contradiction. Proof by contradiction is the best option if you really can prove it using direct and contrapositive. This concludes our lesson on proving implications, P implies Q. For our next lesson, we will be discussing proofs involving quantifiers.